Good evening and welcome to the St. Vrain Valley Schools Board of Education meeting. Please stand and join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. I'm going to start this evening uh, with a tradition that was started by our previous Board of Education president, Bob Smith, and I'm going to read the district's mission statement. This mission statement is our North Star, and it does guide all of our decision making. It reads as follows to educate each student in a safe learning environment so that they may develop to their highest potential and become contributing citizens. Barb, can you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Ahrens. Here. Mr. Berthed. Present. Mr. Garcia. Here. Dr. Martyr. Present. Ms. Pierce. Here. Mrs. Ragland. Here. And Ms. Segrist. Here, thank you, Barb. Have there been any addendums or changes to the agenda this evening? There have not. Thanks, Barb. And the last time I spoke with you, there was not any audience, there was no audience participation. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, and we get back to visitors, which um, has been a, a fairly empty slot ever since COVID. So that brings us pretty quickly to agenda item five, Don, which is the superintendent's report. All right. Well, I appreciate that, Joey. Thank you. A couple things. One, I've had a chance to get into every school and several of the schools more than once and uh, very, very appreciative and uh, impressed by what I've been seeing. I've had the opportunity to stand behind some teachers while they have their students on the screen and wave to the students and make a connection there. And, uh, and talk to a lot of teachers about the kinds of work they're doing with the synchronous learning model. And uh, the reports in terms of student attendance are very good. We're getting very high student part participation and attendance. And I think the combination of being able to see your teacher and being able to hear your teacher and have that verbal interaction, I also think it's been uh, it's been good for the students to be able to see directly into the classrooms and to see all of the instructional materials and displays and demonstrations in that environment. I think that's important. It sets the stage for the learning. Um, but I'm very, very proud of our teachers and our staff. The buildings look really incredible in terms of not only their cleanliness, but also the uh, renovations and the bond projects, which you'll hear a little bit more about. So that's the synchronous learning piece. The launched ed, which we had about, we have about 27, 2800 students enrolled in launched ed. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I would share with you, it's a unique situation because normally when we open a school, we start a full year in advance and we hire a principal and we hire a leadership team and we hire secretarial support and we involve a lot of different people in that process and that's when it's one level, elementary or middle or high school. So the concept of opening a pre-K through 12 school with numbers twice as large as our largest school in a matter of weeks is something that I don't think should go unnoticed I notice in a couple of places where they've tried to do it, they have consistently backed up the start date by first a week and then another week and then another week. You know, our team took that challenge on and it does not come without struggles and difficulties for sure. We also had about 600 people register two days before the close of registration. And so if you can imagine in a traditional school, if you had 600 students show up on your doorstep two days before you were getting ready to build a schedule, you would then have to hire teachers. And so they onboarded and hired you know, over 100 teachers in a short period of time, moved the scheduling around. One of the early challenges was the electives piece. They have resolved that to the, for the most part. 
by allowing students to sign up for an elective or two at their home school. And so that piece is being finalized. Our elementary schools now, the schedules are primarily done, the high schools, the middle schools, all the cores, and they're continuing to make progress with nailing down the electives. Also making sure all of the students are registered as full-time students. So uh, I appreciate that, and I also appreciate the community's patience and understanding that when you go to an undertaking like this. The other thing that I think is also important in recognizing the teachers and the staff is this is all on the heels of a $15 million overnight budget cut. And so it's not as if you can hire all of the people that are necessary to do the work. Because, you know, if you remember in 2002, a $14 million budget cut brought the district to its knees. And so a $15 million budget cut overnight is not conducive to opening up a 3,000 student high school K pre-K through 12. But nonetheless, they've done that and it's up and running and we're gonna continue Kale and Ann and those folks. Um, and I am very appreciative of the, the patience that the community has demonstrated and the support. It's always a good news story when you talk about the community in St. Vrain. They are, they are very supportive. And I also want people to know that we acknowledge that there are challenges, but we feel like we're moving forward in a, uh, in a positive way right now with both the synchronous learning and the asynchronous learning. There are gonna continue to be some challenges. One of the other challenges that we faced is with technology, sometimes you have people make really poor choices and they will log in uh, inappropriately and sometimes they will do things that are uh, racist in nature. They will do things that are extremely, extremely uh, disturbing. We have put, in, uh, put into place mechanisms to block that. You have to log in from a St. Rain website or email address. You also have to have a password, and then the teacher has to let you in. So all of the things that we can do in working with Cisco, I know that this has been a problem across the state and across the country. Um, it's been reported on by a number of law enforcement agencies. And what I want, uh, and I've shared this with our principals and our staff, is that we have no tolerance for that and those kinds of behaviors will be turned over to law enforcement and they will be met with significant discipline in terms of from a school district's response. So again, I'm speaking to a very, very small fraction of our students because overwhelmingly they have been outstanding as have our teachers and staff, but whenever you have a system like this across the country, it invites some of these extremely serious behaviors and so we're addressing that in a very serious way. So that's kind of the totality of the synchronous learning and the launch dead. A recent letter just went out sharing all of pretty much what I shared with you with our community, the, uh, those folks that are uh, signed up for launch dead. But it's going well and uh, our teachers and our students and our parents have a lot to be proud of and again I want to thank them for their their patience and their support I also want you to know that uh, Jackie and her team, Carrie and Michelle, and they put together a parent resource support center where you can go in and you can log into WebEx help, you can log into Schoology help, you can log into all of these Seesaw help and things like that. And Jackie will get into that detail with you in just a little bit. We also have our reopening team continuing to meet today. We met with Dr. Urbina. We met with Jeff Zayak, who's the director of uh, Boulder County Health, and Heather Crate, who's the school liaison for this COVID virus response. And then also uh, Jackie, Carrie, and other members of our team. And Jim, thank you for attending. And we have established in partnership with them very clear criteria that we will be looking at and monitoring the data in order to make a decision as to what we're going to do in October and that obviously will made, be made before October but um, and we also agreed uh, uh, Steve Villarreal was there along with uh, Fran Doherty and we agreed that uh, we're going to continue to have these conversations with all of the association reps and then 
do a webinar or a presentation on WebEx to the entire community who can log in sometime mid-September to see what those criteria look like and what the data is showing. The good news right now is that the data in Boulder County and Weld County is coming way down, and that's good in terms of rates, positivity rates and things. One of the most onerous challenges for us continues to be the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment that requires quarantining and closures and all sorts of reactions to people if they test positive or if they are probable or suspected. In St. Brain, we have had now 68 scenarios where we have had to ask people to quarantine. If we were to have had students in school, those numbers would be in the thousands at this point. Because if you have a high school teacher, for example, and they teach six classes, and they have a suspected case, and all six of those classes of 25 to 30 students then have to be quarantined, that one person being quarantined can result in 150 to 180 students being quarantined. And so we're having to monitor that and, and pay attention to that. Um, and all of that data will be looked at as we make our decisions to, to come back to some form of in-person learning, which, again, to reiterate, is our, is our priority. That is what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so, so I guess stay tuned and we will send communication out to our community with those dates and times and how to log in to participate and to see and hear that information from our health experts. Um, but I do want to emphasize because a lot of times we're looking at the data and it's showing one thing, but what the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is requiring us to do in response to not only a positive COVID, but someone who demonstrates symptoms, whether it's COVID or not, until it's proven not to be. And as you can imagine, in schools, lots of people have sore throats and coughs and fevers and demonstrate these things. And when that happens, then you, it triggers these requirements. And this is what we're pushing really hard to get some of that relaxed. Um, and at the end of the day, we'll have to see where that goes. But, but we're pushing really hard to come back to in-person learning. The other uh, thing that I would share with you is the COVID testing for our teachers and staff. We're looking to start that in that first week in, right after the first week in September, where they can get two tests at no cost to the individual. And then once we get through that first round, we'll make a determination around October and keep going as long as we need to. And that information will be very helpful for us as well. And Jackie will share a little bit about that with you as she has been immersed uh, for a long time with Greg and others ironing out all of the details with our attorneys with the Gary uh, Community Foundation, Family Foundation. Uh, let's see, I do want you to know that on a positive note, I've been able to deliver about 25 uh, bells for 25 years of service. I've got two more to deliver tomorrow, but it's been great uh, making the rounds in the schools and seeing some of our, you know, our outstanding teachers and staff members who have been with us for a long time, very proud of them, and that's been great to see and uh, recognizing them for their great work. Also, in terms of grants, we recently were awarded a multi-hundred thousand dollar counselor core grant, which gives us opportunities to hire even more counselors than the counselors we added from the general fund last year. And then we also won a hundred thousand dollar grant from Boeing, one of their larger grants, to continue to pursue the work that we're doing at the Innovation Center. And then we won a $494,000 NSF grant around cybersecurity, so we're moving forward now with opening up and the planning process for our cybersecurity P-TECH program at Silver Creek and Longmont in that area. We'll have to nail down all of the logistics. But so some great news with all of that. We've also been having a good deal of success with our fall sports activities, whether it's the, the tennis teams that you've seen or the cross-country teams or the, uh, the softball teams that have been out there. and 
it's been really good to see. So very proud of our students and uh, hopefully some of that success will, will continue. And, uh, and then uh, I guess the last thing that I would share, October counts, we've had two of them now. And from the first to the second, we ended up gaining about 80 students but our enrollment is down, which is to be expected. It's going to be down across the entire metro area. And so we're going to continue. We've got several counts that are planned. And we have identified what that would mean from a financial perspective and also from a logistical perspective in terms of do we need to move people from one building to the next to balance everything out. And so we're in the process of doing that. But we've got a pretty good handle on on where we are and we'll continue to monitor that all the way up through uh, the next month and let you know where that goes. So with that, Jackie, I'm going to ask, sure. you know, let turn over to you and you can talk a little bit about the uh, parent support group and then also you've got some recognitions there mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the COVID testing and, and whatever else you think you'd like yeah. to share. Okay, so um, Don is correct in that we have had for a while a number of resources and supports for parents, but they lived in different locations. Some of them lived on DTS's web page. We've sent some of them out in letters, some links out in letters, and just decided that it would probably be much more user-friendly for our families if we put all of these resources into one location, and that location is displayed very prominently on our, our website, on the, the front page, the home page of our website. So this is what it looks like. Most importantly, um, is an easy way for parents to request personalized text support through a user-friendly form. So regardless of what parents are um, challenged with, they have a way to reach out and to get support from one of our tech people at DTS um, with whatever personalized challenge they might be having. So that's that's first and foremost. Then as we, um, you know, we give some, inf uh, some general information for those who are still new to using the iPad. Our iPads are set up very specifically for St. Brain and for the learning that will happen in St. Brain. So parents sometimes need some direction and some support around the use of the student iPad. And then our website also gives information on internet access, both at the district locations, but also ways to affordably gain access to the, to the internet in their own homes. So we give some information to families about that as well. We provide procedures on how to set up WebEx for your child. This is our process that we're using to deliver direct instruction synchronously. So it's really important that our families know how to use Web WebEx, how to download it, and also how to protect students in terms of their privacy and how to get into different classrooms um, based on the links and the new procedures that Don uh, also alluded to this evening. So we offer a tutorial around WebEx uh, moving down the page, we get into our learning management systems. And in St. Vrain, we have two. We have Schoology for grades 4 through 12. And we have Seesaw for grades pre-K through 3. And we offer videos. Our learning services team put together videos that help parents understand our learning management system and what kind of information you can find on that system how you can access assignments, see what your children are completing, get the directions from the teacher, and it just allows parents to monitor those assignments on the front end. Because then as we move down, we uh, talk more about Infinite Campus, and that's the rear view mirror. Schoology and Seesaw are the windshield. That's where I get to see what my student is being assigned. Infinite Campus helps parents, as you all know, monitor grades, attendance and see any assignments that are missing and so we offer again directions and we've done this for years it's become more important recently but we offer directions on how you set up your notifications and and what are the things that you can monitor related to student um, academic progress in infinite campus uh, you have seen the english 
facing side to this, all of these resources are also translated in Spanish as well. And so we've just, we've had, again, these resources for a number of months. Um, we started working on them last spring when we had to go online so quickly. But uh, again, we just, after you know hearing some parent feedback, even at our last board meeting, decided it, we needed to get them all in one location and make it easy for them to find. So I'll stop there on this topic and see if there's any questions or um, anything that you'd like to, to ask. And if not, I'll move on to a couple of other agenda items. Jackie, just real quick, can you say how to get there from our website again? Or where on our website is that found? Uh, so it is, it's found on our front COVID page. So on the, our home page is our, a link to our COVID page. Okay. And this is displayed on our COVID page. Perfect, thank you. From our homepage, and you'll see this large orange bar, um, and that actually is on every school website as well. So this is across our system. You see links here in both English and Spanish. So whichever language is your preference, you would click there to access the reopening plan. And this takes you to our coronavirus website that houses all of the information that we've put together related to school reopening. And we've added prominently on the homepage on both English and Spanish, the technology support center button so when you click that it takes you directly to that support center that has all of those resources it's also accessible if a parent um, is on the elementary school page and is looking through the elementary school information the technology support center is also accessible straight from any of our leveled pages on that website thank you mm -hmm. jay also just wanted to say um mention thank you to everyone involved in also getting this up in Spanish, um, it's, you know, I know a huge undertaking, but so important and, and much appreciated, so thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to some celebrations that we have this evening. Jackie, can sure. I just jump in real quick? Are, you, are we um, already seeing solid utilization of that, of the consolidated resources and the technical support? Are we you tracking it yet? You know, we just uh, pulled it all together on Monday okay and made sure that everything was translated and it, it it's live now so we can monitor that as we go okay yes okay great sounds good Okay, great, thanks. We can give an update at that at some point, yeah. Okay, so I, I want to just um, talk a little bit today about uh, some things that have been going on in the area of reading, early literacy to be exact. Over the summer, we had a mobile innovation lab tour. It was our St. Brain Reads tour. I just wanted to give an update about that because I talked about it earlier in the summer and then said I would come back and update you. That mobile labs had 10 different stops within each feeder and also at Stapp Toyota. We gave away over 3,800 books in grades K through 12. We were highlighted in two publications. Uh, people were very excited about the mobile lab being out in the community, so the Times Call and the Longmont Leader covered uh, had stories hey Jackie yes uh, just one thing you know as I'm looking at this picture down in the left hand corner mm -hmm. you know I can see the staps there yes and you know what I would want to just share is from way back you know 20 years ago when I was the principal at Niwot High School that this family was instrumental with our weight room construction with our scoreboards out at the baseball field they have been truly supporting us with thousands and thousands of dollars for years it's an incredible family and I really want them to know how much we appreciate it 
their kids, you know, played football and other things at Niwa, and they're grown now and have their own kids. But it's just a real testament to how Staff Toyota has come back and continues to give back to this community for years. So, thanks. They are. They were really excited to have the mobile lab at their business on that day, and they invite us back often. So we enjoy being there. It's it's really a great central location out in the Carbon Valley area. And then uh, we also had a parent who uh, provided this quote about the mobile lab. On behalf of all of the St. Vrain Valley st School District students who picked up books in Lyons today, thank you. What an amazing and fun program you have put together. We are so grateful that you squeezed in Lyons Elementary School as your big grand finale. The book selection and organization by reading levels, reading levels were great and students who were managing the book tables were very professional and helpful. What a great crew. And that came from one of our Lions parents. They probably loved having it at the end because we gave away books like crazy to that last stop. And we did have student workers work the mobile lab all summer. And they really were. They were just fabulous kids. So we appreciate all, all that went into that. Colin Rickman is our mobile lab coordinator. And he has a lot of energy. He's planning some great things for the fall. We're going to try to get out to elementary schools and do science, little science in a bag experiments where we host almost a Bill Nye the Science Guy type lesson from the mobile lab and students can do the lesson using the materials we've distributed um, in baggies at home along with the teacher who's going to teach that lesson. So we're excited about that. We also are looking to do a design challenge in a bag and again have those materials at various schools for distribution and then allow students to do design challenges from home. So we're just trying to find ways to bring STEM to them. <laughs> okay, and then another celebration that I have is that we just calculated the summer reading challenge for Mayan, and we, had, we, we calculated all of the minutes that students read, and we had three winners, and two of our winners our first time winners for the, the Mayan Challenge. Our first place winner, and they've been winners before, is Hygiene Elementary, and their students read an average of 121 minutes uh, this past summer, and 379 students were involved in their Mayan Challenge. And then our second place winner, and this is their first time, is Indian Peaks Elementary, 337 students and they read an average of 95 minutes per student. And then Rocky Mountain Elementary was our third place winner, and they had 389 students involved for an average of 72.90 minutes. And so Dr. Haddad was able to deliver their big checks. They're always appreciative of that. Most of the time they use it to buy books so that students have more reading materials. And so he was able to deliver those this last week as well. And then the last celebration I have is actually a Superintendent's Excellen Excellence in Education Award. This was um, an award that Ashley Swanson, who is our coordinator for e-learning, put in. So she wrote this. And um, I would also like to recognize Ashley, even though she submitted this award on behalf of the teachers who taught e-learning this summer, e-credit recovery. Really, all of the things those teachers did would not have been possible without the leadership from Ashley, so I'm going to include her in this award as well. So Ashley Swanson wrote, I would like to nominate the team of educators that ran and supported the 2020 summer school session for an Excellence in Education Award. Working in St. Vrain, you never have to look far to see innovation, excellence, hard work, and passion because it's all around us. But this team of educators exceeded all expectations in unprecedented times in education. After a sudden shift to online in the spring, these educators willingly, willingly jumped into the first ever online summer school session all the while knowing that the fall semester ahead of them would likely bring many changes as well. This year's online summer program 
proved to be much more challenging and time consume, consuming than previous summer school sessions. Many of our teachers were working eight hours a day instead of the normal three hours a day. Teachers were answering emails in the evenings and on weekends. They were making support calls weekly, in some cases daily, and providing face-to-face -face support for students who needed. To every late registration, class size increase, parent support request, these teachers said yes. In every conversation and meeting, teachers expressed genuine concern about students completing their courses and getting on track for graduation. These teachers relentlessly pursued student engagement and academic success. These incredible educators represent what education should look like in the middle of a global pandemic and embody the heart and the passion of what makes St. Rain so great. I am inspired by each of them and thankful for the work of such incredible educators. And I can honestly say that we tracked, especially on our seniors, and um, many of our seniors made it to graduation day because of the work that took place over the summer to help them finish up um, their last credits. And really this group of educators did whatever it took. I'd like to read their names, the list is long, it's about 20, 20 names, but I'd like to individually recognize them. So from Skyline is Michael Aragon, Alma Ariano, Christopher Blair, Stephanie Bragalone, Thomas Caliento, Elizabeth or Beth, Beth Cerrone, Frank Safris, Karen Gaughan, Laura Guida, Jackie Higgins, Stacy Hopel, or Hoople, Carly Jerome, Andrew Kaplan, Shannon Crack, Amanda Kerjack, Beth Lee, Elena Mativer, Mativier, Elena Mativier, Michelle Mills, Rashani Obiri, Rebecca Reed, Kelsey Roberts, Shannon Rodriguez, Tracy Sandler, Katie Schmidt, Andrew Scott, Michelle Scott, Christina Smith, Donna Stamfel, Emily Stirr, Michelle Sullivan Blanken, Ashley Swanson, Greta Von Ber Bernuth, Aaron Warren, Whitney Weiss, Dallin Wright, and that's it. And so again, uh, we have certificates. Normally we would have them at the board meeting and Dr. Haddad would give the superintendents awards to them. We are going to find a way to connect with them um, at their schools or in a central location so that we can recognize each of them individually. But they really are a fabulous group and really very much exemplified everything that is right about the teaching profession and everything that's right about the teachers in St. Brain. And the last thing that I will update you on is just our COVID testing. Um, Dr. Haddad is right. We are looking to begin that the day after the Labor Day, so September 8th. Um, we made a determination just this evening that we're going to use the Innovation Center. We can control a lot of the variables that we need to do with the testing mm -hmm at one of our own facilities. That is a very centralized facility that does not have a lot of traffic right now. It has good traffic flow. It's uh, within uh, and away from a, a highly populated neighborhood area. There are some houses there, um, but many are still under construction. So we will house it there for the month of September and look as to whether we'll continue to house it there in months after that. We will set the the testing site up on September 4th, if all goes well, and begin that testing. We are anticipating about 300 tests a, a day. We will operate from noon to 5 p.m. In order to get the results back in a expedited way, we have to get them FedExed out by, by about five or six each evening. So we will wrap it up by 5 p.m. so we can get the tests out. We uh, potentially will have results back within 48 hours sometimes 72 hours, but 
that two to three day window is really important because if we don't have to keep people out or keep them quarantined beyond three days, um, of course, you know, it, it's, it's good to have everyone back as much as possible to give us stability. So that's what we're looking at. We're working with Gary Community Foundation. Um, our, our, our district is covering the expense for our employees for those first two tests. The data will be really useful as we look ahead to what our potential models for bringing students back might be. And you know, I think our, our teachers and staff members have requested easy access to testing. So this is another way that we're able to support our, our staff in St. Vrain. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Don, did you have anything else to add? Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, <coughs> yeah, the meeting was very, uh, I mean, it was very thorough. It covered uh, an awful lot of information that uh, as we go through that process next week when we meet again, uh, is starting to clarify what we're trying to get Boulder County Health to, to help us with. Um, because we, we get settled up with them and then the state health comes in with new new requirements. So they said that they're pushing f against that and uh, they didn't, don't didn't necessarily refer to that, but they definitely are trying to push back at some of the uh, some of the requirements the state threw at us at the last minute that changed everything we were doing. But I thought it was very good and I think the planning to be able to get that WebEx with those folks is uh, our speakers and give the information directly from them, directly to, to the to our, our staff and our and our clients. That's I think that's critical. So I'm looking forward to the meeting next Wednesday. I'm sure, it'll be even more information, <coughs> and more progress. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Paula, did you have a question? Jackie, I just had a quick question on the COVID testing for the teachers. So it's it's um, they don't have to be symptomatic. It's it's and it's voluntary. They can go just they can go get it if they want it. That's correct. It, it is voluntary, although their uh, results will be reported to the district and to Boulder County Public Health, so that we can, in an aggregate way, really monitor just the health of the community and the health of our organization. So um, if they're asymptomatic um, and, and someone was positive, we, it, would, it would be that turnaround time, that two to three day turnaround time Correct. where we would know and then we would take responsive action as required. Yeah, and Paul, I, I know you know this, but the, it's teachers and all staff. So oh, all staff. The entire, okay. all employees have access to it. That's right. So if, if, uh, so if they were positive, then they would have to stay out of the building, right? They would have to Correct. quarantine. Um, and would we get subs in place for them or? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the, the circumstances. If they're a teacher and it requires a substitute, we would either, we have options to either pair them up with another teacher of a similar subject and or if the teacher is able to do something at home if they're being quarantined, they could conceivably run that lesson from there as well. And then we would backfill with some support for supervision and things like that. So it all depends on how many students are impacted uh, as to whether or not. Um, we're not we're not counting on substitute teachers to be able to fill some of these. If we can utilize them, we will, but we do not anticipate having a large pool of substitute teachers that can come in into that kind of an environment and, and pick up the lessons. Okay. Because of the, the nature of the technology that's involved. You know, we've taken them through some training but our teachers who are ongoing teachers have gone through some pretty good training and have that skill set down. And so we would like to utilize them as much as possible as long as you know, we're maintaining their health as our first priority. Okay. And, and if a teacher is symptomatic, um, we ask them to stay out of the building because of the symptoms and then they can be tested either through this this arrangement or they can just they can privately go correct out to the community to get a test but correct okay yeah symptomatic even if they've not been confirmed as a covid case 
Yeah, they have to stay out of the, stay out of the building. And then again, you'll either they can either work from home or if they're feeling up to it, or the teachers will consolidate the broadcast. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank during you. the during the COVID testing, we have covered the cost of two tests per month per employee. But if somebody becomes symptomatic within that two week window, they can go back for another test. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. I, I, Don, I just had a, I appreciated your update on the attendance we saw in the first, the good report on the attendance uh, in the first weekend, the preliminary work that uh, the, the staff is doing with regard to enrollment. Uh, I was wondering, do, are we at a point where you have some initial numbers or do you want to wait until uh, Further on, I, I'd be interested in what the initial attendance numbers and what it looks like the enrollment decline might look like. Yeah, we have uh, some preliminary numbers, but uh, we're still wanting to make sure that we go through a couple more counts before we put any information out, just because it's so fluid that it can shift. Like in one day, it shifted by over 80 students. And so it's just some people are still coming back from vacation from different locations in the summer. And then there's been that movement between launched ed and the synchronous learning model at the home schools. And so I just, I, I know when I put something out, people will hold on to it, even if it's going to shift by hundreds of students. So I just like to wait maybe one more week. That's fine. So. <coughs> yeah, I understand that. I was just wondering where you were in that process. Yeah, Thanks. no, it's a great question because we anticipate that it will be, uh, you know, there'll be a, a number of students. In terms of decline, I read uh, I read an article in the paper. One of our neighboring districts, they were reporting initial reports of like a thousand students down. And so, we'll just kind of see where where we land with that. And then some of it is the difference between FTE and student. So you sometimes with preschool or kindergarten, it might be a half time student. So it's a body count, but also an FTE count. And sometimes those are two different things. So. We're trying to look at how the impact on the budget's gonna be. Thanks. You bet. John. Thank you very much. Um, I guess due to Paula's question, I do have a question about the COVID testing. Okay. And I'm wondering um, if it's voluntary, um, how significant numbers, I mean, what numbers are we hoping to get in terms of testing was it until we have a significant data point where we could actually make some smart decisions? And next, if a teacher is um, showing signs, are, are they delegated or mandated to take a test or is it all still voluntary at that point? Yeah, so we have requested between two and 4,000 tests. So they will be, they will be uh, Gary Community and COVID Colorado will be ready to administer during the month of September up to four 4,000 tests. And we could increase that midway through if we're seeing a, a really high high interest. Um, n none of the testing will be mandated. Uh, however, if a staff member is symptomatic, they will be asked to stay home because we need people to be healthy who are in, in the schools. And so, um, you know, we, we will encourage testing. It's a quick way to clear um, your health and to demonstrate that you're you're ready to come back to work and so we'll certainly encourage that but none of the testing will be mandated yeah, they shifted their you know uh, originally when i say they i mean the uh the health authorities originally it was if you have a positive test then you have to continue to go back until you get a negative and then they shifted it to where it would be about a 10-day period of time and then any time after that if you are without fever and without the support of any kind of medicine to bring that fever down for f the 48 hours, then you could return. Um, so if you're not taking Tylenol or something like that and your fever comes down and it stays down, um, so we would still have those screening mechanisms in place before we l allowed somebody to come back into the building to make sure they were fever-free and symptom-free at that point. I, I was just alluding to the fact that if we have a test base of 6% of the population of staff and teachers versus 60%, we're going to be able to make some smarter decisions as to when we might be able to return to 
in school learning. Um, so I, I was hoping that you know teachers would want to find out um, if they have asymptomatic or, or if they're infected and, and, and the, in terms of hope that we will be getting back to in student learning in the, in the classrooms. Don and Jackie, thank you. I would like to, on behalf of the board, recognize all of the recipients of the 25-year bells, and then Jackie, the uh, Superintendent's Excellence in Education Awards as well. Those are, are two things that, as a Board of Education, we very much look forward to celebrating in person here at a meeting, and we aren't able to do that this year. So thank you for Jackie for delivering those, Don, you know, for delivering those. I know that that takes extra time out of your day, but I'm pleased that you can connect with those people and uh, we congratulate them and, and thank them for everything they do for St. Brain and public education. Thank you. Don, as you know, I was thinking back, as everybody was talking and um, you were giving your update and Jackie w was sharing hers and I was talking with Carrie before the meeting, um, you brought up Launched Ed and really opening a whole new school in a, a very short period of time, multiple schools technically, if you look at the number of students. But when you think back over our first conversations, first meetings in March, um, you've done that with the entire district, really shifted um, more than once, technically, to online learning and then this semester starting with synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so I just want to just publicly thank everyone who's had a hand in that. Um, and I know, Don, your, your leadership has been instrumental. Without the systems in place and the funding in place financially uh, being so strong, this really wouldn't be possible. So thank you for that foresight and leadership. And thank you to everyone who's had a hand in executing. I can't imagine the magnitude. Um, thank you. No, I appreciate that a lot, Joey. And I, I will tell you that uh, we, we definitely appreciate it. And it's just, and I know that you guys have shared this with me many times. Our teachers and our staff have just been incredible. I mean, beyond incredible. And, and our parents have too. You know, our parents have reached out in so many ways to try to offer support. And, you know, we are not by any stretch of the imagination perfect. And we have had some challenges and some struggles and some uh, bumps in the road, some slight and some pretty significant um, as we tried to get Launched Ed up and running and we acknowledge that, but uh, everybody's forging ahead and we're really, really uh, making good progress and we're gonna continue to do that. Our commitment is high, it's just uh, some of these waters are uncharted, and, uh, but without our parents, without our students engaging the way they are, without our teachers, without our staff and our team, uh, none of this would be happening. So I'm very, very appreciative and wanna recognize our entire community for their support. Oh, absolutely. And bumps are to be expected when you're doing something entirely new. But at the end of the day, you know, I started the meeting out by reading the district's mission statement. But at the end of the day, I know every single person who's involved in this, in this endeavor is committed to that mission statement. Um, and, and bumps can be crossed, right? And repaired and absolutely. Um, so thank you just recognize everyone um, who's, who's done that. You know, I was volunteering for the Sunrise Stampede a couple weekends ago and, um, you know, spent a, a good chunk of, of the day there and community schools was there working uh, on a Saturday to get everything together and everything ready for the students to go back to school that next week. Um, and so really, you can look in every nook and cranny of the district and see that dedication. So aren't we fortunate to have the community support and the ability to do that? You know, one other thing, when you said that, it just reminds me, you know, because we're not transporting students right now, but a number of our bus drivers are in the buildings and they've shifted their responsibility to custodial support. And so as I go into the building, I say, you're not driving a bus right now. And they're like, no, we're helping out here. And so a lot of our uh, teams have shifted their responsibilities to, to be helpful. And when you mentioned community schools, you know, we had the two in every elementary school, but we just opened up a third one at Red Hawk based on some community requests. So that community school program right now is, is running pretty well. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and thanks to everybody involved with that. So 
Right. All hands on deck, right? In, in various capacities that may not be typical. So, uh, all right. That brings us to agenda item 6.1, which is a report. Uh, Tracy Burtnett is joining us via WebEx. And Tracy, you're here for your annual cost savings report. We'll give you a minute to, or Greg, are you introducing Tracy? Sure, I can introduce her. Um, okay, I just good saw, evening, everyone. sorry, I saw your initials up there and I thought maybe I had it out of order. So I'll let you take it from here. No, that's, that's great, thanks. Um, Tracy and her staff do a wonderful job um, in procuring for our district. They work very hard, they work diligently, um, and she's gonna just give you some information in terms of what that's looked like um, over the past couple of years. So Tracy. Hello, Thank Tracy. You. Thank you. I'm I'm very pleased to join the board again um, and present uh, our cost savings, our our activities in your procurement department. Um, and over for this year or these last two years in particular, uh, I think what's brought right off the bat a strong point um, for us and the procurement department is tying this um, report to the strategic pri priorities, strong district finances and student and staff well-being. That is something that I think really elevates this information uh, within the district that procurement is seen as more of a strategic partner than um, you know just processing. Um, but our, our report, we demonstrate the value of you know, the services we provide through this report, um, not only cost savings data, but uh, vendor participation in, in each solicitation, um, the, the lead time or uh, timeline, I guess you could call it, of when a, a bid or RFP is released and then uh, a deadline date, and then the surplus property sale proceeds and that disposal process, which uh, bring some revenue return to the district. Um, just to highlight, in fiscal year 19, um, the procurement staff uh, processed total purchases and established contracts in the amount of 6565000 reflecting our cost savings of $1,021,000. Then in fiscal year 20, um, they established uh, purchases and contracts of 5,561,000, reflecting a cost savings of 752,000. So in fiscal year 19, uh, it, it projects a savings rate of 16% overall purchases. And in fiscal year 20, a uh, savings rate of 14% of overall purchases. Um, so in fiscal year 19, we facilitated um, approximately 89 formal invitations to bid or RFPs. Um, then in fiscal year uh, 20, we facilitated 75 formal solicitations. Um, and one of our key performance indicators is, is tracking the turnaround time or the lead time. Typically, we've seen um, average turnaround time to be 25 days from the time a solicitation is posted to the deadline date. Um, then uh, in, but in fiscal year 20, um, due to the pandemic, uh, and then from working from home and more electronically, um, we gained some efficiencies that we learned um, of improving that turnaround time to an average of 14 to um, 18 days from a, the deadline date. Um, and really that was really um, the vendors uh, and the, the market participating um, that they previously, they had been on board uh, with processing and submitting bids and solicitations electronically um, before you know, we went to this process. Um, so going full electronic, uh, we did successfully complete 24 formal solicitations 
um, and working through a virtual virtual processes for um, pre-bid meetings or even a virtual uh, walkthrough. Um, so, you know, being saying that, um, as far as our electronic, going full electronic, I, I'd like to point out, it's on, uh, I believe, the, the bottom of the spreadsheet for uh, the cost savings from July 2019 to 2020. There's a bottom section I've um, put in italics, the, the project descriptions um, of those projects. And those were, those were full electronic um, released and we got proposals back electronically. But I wanted to highlight the asbestos project for Spark. That was the, the first kind of virtual walkthrough we did with suppliers that were pre-qualified and um, that was very successful. We, we partnered with um, the engineer and the procurement staff that helped facilitate a virtual walkthrough and um, the, the vendors understood it. it. It went really well. It just, just the amount of time that it saved and the expense, you know, not only for the district, but also for the supplier. Um, returning to you know, our overall uh, procurement value results, the, um, the graph there, you can see over a seven year history, the procurement team has continually achieved the cost savings, you know, that, uh, significantly that um, our, our department total cost um, to the district, you know, we're more than covering ourselves. Um, and also wanted to reflect, um, you know, I overall really uh, trust is the most valuable asset in public procurement. And I, I think this report over the, the past two fiscal years really reflects the high level of trust, um, integrity in the process, the procurement team projects, and re really the trust within the community that, um, you know, St. Brain is respected and our suppliers and that participate know um, the integrity of the process is kept and it's fair. And uh, it, I'm just really proud of kind of the results over you know, my tenure being here as director of procurement. And I'd be glad to address any questions or in, any, any other, um, you know, anything I can bring back to clarify or, or other questions you might have. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Do board members have any questions or comments? Hi, Tracy. Um, thank you. I don't really have a, a question because I find the report very thorough. Um, I really uh, appreciate the format of the whole thing, how you kind of walk us through your, your process and how the cost savings are generated and then how you, you compare that to your own budget. Um, and truly, you made the point, you, you all pay for yourselves and are a really a critical point of the overall financial um, responsibility that we have as the in the district as a whole, like centralizing your um, skill sets in your department and um, trusting you guys to handle it, I'm sure it takes a lot of stress off of every department, particularly transportation and O&M and the ones that utilize you a lot. Um, I'm sure they appreciate it tremendously that you can actually spearhead all of this and manage all of this on their behalf. Um, but I just wanna thank you for the, for the report, the um, accuracy of it, the comprehensive nature of it and um, all the great work that you guys that you guys do because it's it's critically important that um, as far as the public and public tax dollars that we are responsible for those and and this is a perfect example of that so thank you thank you Paula Dick thank you Joy <coughs> uh, Tracy I, as I did last year I want to uh, uh, recognize really the the excellent work that you and your department are doing and uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, you have focused on the value of your work to the district, uh, primarily within the context of uh, money saved uh, and the uh, regular purchasing process that you're, uh, we go through. Uh, I, 
it's clear that you're saving uh, money and in, in that the uh, uh, cost of your functions are um, uh, more than compensated by by the money that is being saved through your operations. But I, I would submit that, as Paula uh, mentioned, that it's, it's every bit as important. Uh, your role, the, the part of your role which uh, clearly establishes that every uh, cost savings that is possible is being uh, achieved for our district and that the process is squeaky clean at every level um, is, is, in my view, as important as uh, the dollars that you're saving uh, for our district operations. So uh, I think that you and your department are to be uh, tremendously commended for not only um, ensuring that every public dollar is uh, well invested, but also, uh, and that the district uh, receives this, uh, the dollar savings, but also uh, providing um, clear assurance that um, the uh, function of your uh, department uh, helps, uh, makes it clear that um, all of the processes uh, for which we have fiduciary responsibility uh, are done in, uh, with a tremendous uh, commitment to excellence. So thank you um, uh, to you and your staff for your continued good work uh, over multiple years uh, and this last year being the most recent example. Thank you, Dick. John? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, I do want to also commend your efforts and your whole team. What I enjoy seeing is the number of bids and the ranges, and I, and I think that really shows the due diligence in terms of really procuring the best, um, not always the, 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 well, the best route available for the district to save money and to get the best products. So thank you very much. I know you do a great job, and the report is well orchestrated and put together, so thank you. Tracy, I'll echo what already uh, what board members have said, and thank you for being here this evening. And please pass along to your uh, entire department the Board of Education's appreciation. Yes, and thank you. That uh, appreciation from the board, you know, the superintendent, uh, Greg, you know, all the leadership is greatly appreciated, and that that just means a lot to all of us. And just the support that you have have for us and and backing us that way. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, be safe. Enjoy your evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Agenda item seven is our consent items. Paul, I think you are going to make a brief comment about the two policies before we, before we jump into that. Uh, yes, very quickly, I just wanted to remind the board and the, and the public um, that we are working through a chunk of policies that need to be updated to comply with uh, recent changes to Title IX at the federal level with Colorado State legislation that was passed um, this last spring, as well as reopening schools uh, in the COVID-19 environment. So the two that we have added to the consent agenda today are an extension of all of that, um, JII student concerns, complaints, and grievances, and LBD relations with district charter schools have been highly vetted through our standard process. These recommended changes come uh, very often from CASB or from our attorneys. They are parsed out to each of the departments and the policy owners uh, who go through it with staff looking for best practice, law compliance, um, really uh, through the eyes of, of, of reality and how best to align these policies with the work that we do and comply with the law. Um, and then they, they are uh, reviewed by our attorneys and they get back to us. So again, it's a, very, it's a very detailed, very thorough review process. Everything is highly vetted by the time it comes to us. This is a continuation of that process. Um, and I believe there's still eight that are in the hopper. Um, they will get to us when the process is, is done and they all will pertain to students. They'll be in the category of J, so they'll, they'll be under students. And I think Jackie is, is running with those now, but we will get those when those are ready. Um, just continuing the process and I, that's it. Just a quick update on all that. Thank you, Paula. 
Then uh, before I re read the consent items, did board members wish to pull any? We have two this evening. Did board members wish to pull those? All right. Then we have uh, consent item 7.1, approval, first reading, adoption, board policies, JII, student concerns, complaints, and grievances, and LBD, relations with district charter schools. 7.2, approval of request to grant an exception to board policy GBEA, staff ethics, conflict of interest, Kelleher. I would entertain a motion for approval, please. So moved. By John and a second. Second. By Chico. Barb, can you call for the vote, please? Mr. Ahrens? Aye. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mrs. Ragland? Aye. And Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thanks, Barb. Agenda item eight brings us to our action items. 8.1 is a recommendation for the adoption of resolution equalizing the director district population for 2020. Uh, Scott, I believe we have you with us on WebEx. I'll get, give you a second to unmute and get settled if need be. Okay, I think I'm live. Do you see me? Uh, I can see you. Absolutely. It's been a while. It's, uh, okay. it's a pleasure to see you. Yeah, good to see you all. Good evening. Uh, I've got two items and I'll just, uh, I'll start with the director districts. Uh, this is required by state statutes every four years to equalize the director district populations. Um, so it's a state statute. The primary purpose is to make sure that the populations of each district are as close as possible, that the uh, districts are contiguous and they're compact in shape. Uh, so the primary purpose is to equalize them so that we're drawing future board members from an equal area. So I guess I wanna reassure you, it doesn't change any of your assignments. I think there was a question about that as far as what schools you tend to serve um, some of the boundaries may have moved in and out of certain buildings, but the attendance areas are all the same within your areas. So I wanna walk you through a little bit of a PowerPoint here first, um, to just talk about some of the changes. And okay, so from the beginning, do uh, you all have this uh, chart up? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is every four years, uh, substantially equal populations. We try to keep it within 1%. That's kind of been a, a standard we've held of each other. Um, here's what you can see how things have changed over the past four years. Um, the blue bars are the current populations of the districts. So you can see that D, F, and G are the significant areas of growth. Um, and A and C in particular uh, just had kind of minimal growth. So our task really was to try to expand the area of A and C while reducing D, F, and G to get a good balance. Uh, the average population in 2016 was 23,000. You can see we've grown to an average of 26,000 per district. So over this time period, we've we've added 18,000 residents to our district. Um, as kind of a comparison, the previous four years, um, 2012 to 2016 was only a growth of 6,000. So uh, our growth really ramped up population-wise within our district. Um, so with the, the proposed uh, boundary adjustments, um, expanding A and C, uh, shrinking the areas of um, D, F, and G, we've come up with a pretty balanced uh, uh, scenario. So it really falls in line with, with what state statutes require. Um, 
going into the map, um, the black lines, and this might be kind of hard to, to see, but I have some zoom up maps. The black lines are the old 2016 boundaries, and the colored shapes are the, the new 2020 boundaries. So if we zoom in on um, the A and C areas where we had to expand, you can see where we had to grow um, to the east. Um, there was um, F, F still does represent skyline. It's in that area. It has Fall River Trail Ridge, but it also extends out to the Mead area as it has before. Um, uh, B and um, you can see some of the changes that had to be made to be along or south of Clover Basin Drive and then a new area along Quicksilver. Uh, we didn't have to do quite as much with that. And really our overall goal was try to make these a little bit more compact so that um, citizens or others couldn't accuse us of gerrymandering districts for certain purposes. So that was our goal. Um, uh, G uh, changed slightly. Uh, some of the areas um, uh, took in different subdivisions to try to balance the population. And that's really the, the summary of the maps. Um, really, it was, it's kind of a team effort, effort between Ryan and Heidi and our department of pulling building permits, certificate of occupancies, and um, census data, and then tr trying to comply with the state statute requirements. So in your packet, um, also included is the resolution, the uh, legal descriptions, and then the chart that shows where the physical building is. But, but once again, that doesn't need to represent or change any of the ways you've been representing schools. That's just where the physical building is. But the attendance area has pretty much stayed the same among each um, director district. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Scott. Any uh, questions or comments by board members? Paula? Hi, Scott, thank you. Um, so just to, to clarify, I'm gonna say back to you what I, what I heard you say. This, I understand the point of this. It's um, legally we have to balance out um, each of our areas that um, right. we are elected from. But it's, this is primarily mm -hmm. for the purposes of our elections, right? So we have an equal number for, of correct. people that are, so anybody living in my district F, the new one, for example, next year my my seat is up. Um, we'll have the opportunity to to elect somebody new. It doesn't have to align with the schools that we choose to represent because there were some no, shifting around no, the doesn't. schools. So, yeah, this doesn't do anything to you who you represent. It's just a state statute requirement to balance for the purposes of elections and where they draw uh, future directors. Okay, thank you. Th I thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Scott, this is Dick Martyr. Uh, it looks, yeah. we also received, good to see you. Uh, we also received uh, yeah. a list of facilities by director district. And that list is, there's some minor changes uh, with regard to the schools that the di directors are, uh, at least occur within the district. And right. it was my impression, uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but it was my impression that uh, those new schools, for example, for D Director District E, the one that I serve, now includes Blue Mountain, um, and that I would be the contact point, if you will, for that that jurisdiction, and that it was not true before. Yeah. So there, again, these are just the uh, the physical buildings uh, that are in these new boundaries. So uh, um, you're your director district E, correct? Yes. So Timberline moved out 
and Blue Mountain moved in. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. You're, you're saying that that's just a, the board can assign whatever schools we want. And my understanding right. is the board is going to sort of realign the schools that we're responsible for based on this uh, state uh, mandate. No. Yeah, there's no, there's no need to realign who you uh, serve or connect with. Um, so, it, you know, if you're comfortable with who with the schools that you're in, that's certainly your uh, right to stay. This ha this document really has nothing to do with um, your kind of areas of responsibility. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Scott. John? Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing because I'm kind of assuming uh, parents that see this might be um, concerned that their schools are going to change, and I think I know the answer to this, but I wanted to just make sure it's publicly said. The um, schools will not draw students from any other um, population uh, in terms of the boundary lines for the schools remain the same. Right. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tony. Anyone else? No? All right. Scott, thank you. I, I think I would just reiterate one more time that this is what you've done is primarily um, uh, for voting purposes, right? So that we're in alignment with statutes. Right. But this Board of Education, right. right, as a Board of Education, we are elected from a specific geographic area, a specific geographic uh, location on the maps that you create. Uh, but as a Board of Education, we are representing all of the students across the district whenever we're making decisions, and that the people that live within those director districts can certainly start with us as a, as a starting point, like Dick mentioned, or they can reach out to anyone on the Board of Education, that, that we're not, um, you know, we're not lording over those districts, so to speak, you know, we're not claiming them to be our own. It's simply for voting purposes, but we do rep represent every student and every family in St. Brain. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Then if there are no other uh, questions or comments, I would entertain a motion for approval for action item 8.1, which is the adoption of resolution equalizing director district population for 2020. So moved. By Karen and a second. By John. Barb. Barb? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the second motion. It was well, made was, by John. Yeah, sorry. John, okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahrens? Aye. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mrs. Ragland? Aye. And Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thank you, Barb. Scott, you also have action item 8.2, which is the recommendation for adoption of adjustment of boundaries between Blue Mountain Elementary, Altona Middle, and Longmont Estates Elementary slash Westview Middle School. Yes, that's correct. Um, I want to walk you through a few slides here. The, the subject area that we're looking at is um, north of Nelson and south of the St. Brain River and uh, you have Hope, Hover and Airport Road on east and west. And this area has long been designated for industrial, commercial types of uses. But over the, over the years, uh, changes in the Longmont City Comprehensive Plan have shifted this area to a, a much stronger density of residential. And it, it kind of raised the question for us as we were reviewing developments and working with the city of uh, a concern that it, this could overcrowd Blue Mountain with all these new units. So it's kind of been on the, the list of consideration among the city of Longmont uh, as they changed uh, densities of developments and, and our staff here in planning to try to see if we could balance uh, future growth here. So it does comply with one of the guidelines that if you know, large developments occur kind of on a boundary area or on an edge between two areas, we could consider looking at uh, adjustments. 
So this kind of fit that kind of area to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, we, we got additional information that some of these developments are a little more imminent now. So we wanted to try to do this before residents uh, start moving in or, you know, houses are being built and they start out in Blue Mountain, for instance, and then change to Longmont Estate. So we kind of want to be uh, ahead of the curve here. So just to kind of highlight some of the things that have changed here, there's um, quite a number of, of developments um, and the boundary line that we're, we've drawn and kind of reviewed with our transportation staff and, and the administrators at all the schools uh, kind of evenly splits what could happen here uh, between Longman Estates and Westview and Blue Mountain and Altona. And it's kind of along Rogers Road there in the middle and then catches a few developments along the edge of Hover. So in some ways, it was kind of a more natural boundary for busing to take kind of that edge area straight up to Longman Estates rather than all the way over to Blue Mountain. So the, the breakdown of total units, uh, 11,000, or uh, well, not quite that many, 1,150 in proposed in the Longman Estates area and 1,044 in Blue Mountain. Um, this is uh, how each one of those breaks out. Uh, so there's a couple of potentially pretty large ones, Mountain Brook and Flatlands annexation. Um, according to the city, uh, the more imminent ones are Fairground Marketplace, Nova annexation, and then some phases of Mountain Brook. So a few in each um, of the two areas. So this would be uh, technically how we would draw the, the Longmont Estates and Blue Mountain boundary. Um, we would uh, implement this um, as soon as, as possible or as soon as you as vote, if you choose to, to vote in. I guess I want to add one other thing. We did work with transportation and uh, made sure that there is no existing resident that is impacted by this boundary. Um, there are only about 10 students in this area right now. And they're, they're kind of in a variety of schools, some in Blue Mountain, Altona, they would remain. There's some that open enroll to Longman Estates, and then there's some that just are open enrolling to a variety of places. So there's not many students in this area right now, and none of them would be changed uh, with this boundary. So I think that's all I had on that. Are there any questions that you have? Questions or comments? No? no. All right. It doesn't appear to be any questions or comments, Scott. We thank you for being forward thinking. And um, yeah, it made it easy. So appreciate it. All right. With okay. that, thank you. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion for approval of action item 8.2, adopting uh, the making the uh, boundary adjustment that Scott just described. So moved. By Jim and a second. Second. Yeah. By Karen. Barb, can you call for the vote, please? Mr. Ahrens. Aye. Mr. Berthold. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Dr. Martyr. Yes. Ms. Pierce. Aye. Mrs. Ragland. Aye. And Ms. Segrist. Aye. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, uh, Scott. It was nice seeing you, and we appreciate your uh, we appreciate your reports this evening. All right. Good to see you all, and thank you. And we'll check in later. Sounds good. Take care. All right. Bye. Greg, you are back up for action items eight point three and eight point four. Eight point three is the approval of updated vendors providing services over one hundred thousand. Yes, yeah, so uh, thanks. Um, let me get my stuff pulled up again here. Take your, take your um, time. No worries. I am good to go. Per board policy DJ, DJA, um, there's a requirement that the board approve all vendors to whom the district pays over 100000 um, for services. So this one is for purchase services. Um, and so in June, 
we did that, um, but we now have some name changes and we have found some um, vendors that, that you know we haven't historically had on the list. Um, and so we are adding those in um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions related to that. Thank you, Greg. Thank any you. questions or comments from the board? Doesn't appear to be any questions or comments, Greg. So we'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, call for a motion for uh, approval of 8.3, which is a recommendation uh, to approve uh, updated vendors providing services over 100,000. So moved. By Chico and a second. Second. By Jim. Barb. Mr. Ahrens. Aye. Mr. Berthold. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Dr. Martyr. Yes. Ms. Pierce. Aye. Mrs. Raglan. Aye. And Ms. Segrist. Aye. Greg, action item 8.4 is also yours, and this is uh, vendors providing goods over $100,000. Exactly, and the same board policy applies, um, and we've had some changes. We have a new uh, dairy vendor, um, but the other thing that I would like to ask is that the board um, approve the increase of the Home Depot Pro line item for this year. We have it as 125000 but our nutrition service department uses them to uh, purchase paper supplies. And with uh, remote learning, we have seen a, a large increase in how much paper supply we need in order to, you know, to provide those meals um, kind of as a grab and go versus in the lunchroom. So I would ask that you approve um, the Home Depot Pro to be 250,000. All right, thank you, Greg. Any uh, comments or questions on that? Dick? Hi, Greg. Uh, this, is Dick, this is Dick Martyr. I, I was just, I had a question about the uh, increase in the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment from $100,000 uh, last year to $600,000. Can, can you uh, shed some light on that? Yeah, we're, we're looking into that, but um, right now there, it appears as if they're allowing substitute teachers if they were working a certain amount of time during the course of the year um, to apply for and receive unemployment. So that, that's the, the biggest part right now. It's not any of our normal employees. It's related to substitute teachers, and we're looking into that to see um, to see how that how that works, how long that lasts, those types of things. So. And and so the uh, the anticipated amount here is one that we may not necessarily uh, pay, but it's kind of a contingency to, to alert, us, just, alert us. We are probably uh, highballing that. So, thanks. Any yep. other questions or comments? All right, then I would entertain a motion for approval of action item 8.4, the recommendation uh, to approve the updated vendors providing goods over 100,000. So uh, second. A motion by Karen and a second by John. And Barb, can you call for the vote, please? Mr. Ahrens? Aye. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mrs. Raglan? Aye. And Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, Greg. It was nice seeing you this evening. Thanks, you too. Yes, take care. Right. You too. We don't have any discussion items this evening, so this brings us to uh, the adjournment of our meeting. I did want to mention that uh, our study session in September has been moved here. Uh, to the boardroom so that we have access with WebEx. We will no longer be meeting at Mead Elementary School. And so Don, if you don't mind, um, if I extend an invitation to the board individually, if they would like to uh, visit Mead High School, you know, typically as a board of education and as a district, we would, we would celebrate uh, the grand opening of an elementary school. And with the current conditions, we're not able to do this. So if the board would like to, to tour, um, is it all right if they contact you? Absolutely, yeah. And John and I had a nice tour of the building the other day. And anytime you all 
uh, are interested in seeing any of the schools. I know you are pretty active and out in the community a lot, and you're in the schools a lot. So absolutely, we'd love to get together anytime and take you there. Thank you. Or on I'm your own if it's more convenient, whatever, whatever works best for you. Great, yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. I yeah. suppose it's not fair of me to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good>. Necessarily. <laughs> yeah, no, I, beautiful school. Um, it's so great. well laid out. Yeah. I've only seen the outside, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, Betsy's done a really nice job of coordinating everything along with Brian Lamer and his team, and mm -hmm. turned out really nice. Great. Thank you. Well, and certainly board members could contact Betsy as well, um, but always important to initially go through you. Yeah. So. No, thanks. All right. Did you have any closing comments, Don, after um, at the completion of the meeting? or? No, no, thank you, though. All right. Great. Then our next Board of Education meeting is right back here in the boardroom on Wednesday, September 9th at 6 p.m. for a regular meeting. And I'll see if I can say this. I seem to mess this up every time, but I would call for a motion for adjournment, not approval, Barb, adjournment. <laughs> so moved. By Karen and a second. Second. By Jim, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Good night.